After trying out the Nuzlocke concept on Persona 5 Royal last year, I got a ton of comments saying that I should do more Nuzlocke's and admittedly this run was a lot of fun, so why not go for it one more time, but with Persona 4 Golden this time around. And since the first run was a little lenient on the rules considering it was the very first attempt at doing something like this, we made a few changes for this one, but let's quickly take a look. First of all, only the first Persona in a dungeon is allowed to be taken. The first time a Persona pops up during shuffle time, we have to select it and are stuck with it until the next dungeon. The exception to this is the tutorial for shuffle which does not count towards that. Unlike last time though, we do however allow fusion since it's pretty similar to evolving Pokemon so I guess that is somewhat fine. Battle difficulty as always is hard. The only difference between hard and very hard is the amount of experience and money you get, but there is no actual difference in enemy AI or amount of damage given and taken so for the sake of keeping my sanity somewhat intact, we go with hard. No items in battle are allowed. This was probably the comment that was pointed out the most to me in my Persona 5 Nozlocke and to be fair, most of you are kinda right about it. Using items in combat is usually not allowed, so we banned that too. We do however allow usage of items outside of battle to heal up for example. Level cap is in place. We are not allowed to exceed the level of the dungeon's main boss, so for example, we are not allowed to go past level 15 in Yukiko's castle. Once we complete it, the cap gets raised again. Dungeons must be completed within a single day. We are allowed to let some time pass before entering, but once we are in the dungeon, it has to be completed without leaving the TV world. Permadeath applies. If a party member goes down, we are not allowed to use them anymore and have to permanently switch them out. If we can't switch them out yet, or we have less than 4 party members remaining, they are allowed to stay in the party but only with 1 HP and are only allowed to guard. If we happen to game over, it is a full reset. We're not going back to the last save point, we have to start the game from scratch all over again, so ultimately, this is the worst thing that could possibly happen. And we also add the classic stuff that is usually not allowed in my challenge runs either, so no use of Tetra Karn, Makara Karn, or any mirrors, no RNG manipulation, and no new game plus. As always, I'm writing the script as I go through the run, so at this point I am just as clueless as you are whether this will work out or not, but before we head into the game, here is a quick word from this video's sponsors Wanted Dead. Wanted Dead is an innovative hack and slash action game from 110 Industries. Crafted by the minds behind Ninja Gaiden and Dead or Alive, this title pays homage to the iconic classics of the PS3 slash Xbox 360 era. Experience an incredible hack and slash gun fu combat system, blending intense melee battles with a katana and pistol, and dynamic ranged combat. In a rather serious setting, the game maintains a self aware approach with an engaging story filled with pop culture jokes and hidden Easter eggs. And as some of you may know, I am a sucker for mini games. Crane gaming, old school side scrolling spaceship shooter, ramen eating competition, all of that is doable. Dive deep into the cyberpunk setting which is inspired by the aesthetics of the late 80s. And by the way, developers have just rolled out the second patch for both PC and console versions of the game, elevating your gaming experience even more. Stay tuned for additional updates and improvements, promising an even more intense adventure ahead. Wanted Dead is available on PS4, PS5, Xbox One as well as the Xbox Series and on PC on Steam and the Epic Game Store. There is also a big sale of the game going on right now where you can get a discount up to 50% until March the 21st. Thank you again to Wanted Dead for sponsoring this video and now let's head back into some Persona action. We start the game, get to name our protagonist with the obvious return of Mr. Nuzlocke and go through the opening cutscenes. Since this is pretty much scripted anyways, we jump forward to the point where the first awakening happens and our first battle begins. The first battle against the two lying Hablery is relatively simple. Just use CO and clean up whatever is left. Luckily we get a full heal right afterwards and then head into the fight against Shadow Yosuke and here is where we run into our first problem already. Shadow Yosuke starts off by hitting our weakness with Garo, so going in we are already down to 50ish HP. The strategy is to use CO to get a one more and then follow it up with a regular attack in order to save HP and SP. 
His regular attacks do roughly 15 damage and when he guards, we guard as well to avoid the one more from another Garu. The problem with this? Izanagi doesn't have any access to any healing spells and with Shadow Yosuke being relatively bulky, there is no way we can finish him off before we run out of HP. So to start this challenge off on a good note, we already game over on the very first battle. While Izanagi does not have healing spells, it does start with Rakukaja, so my second idea was to increase my defense and hopefully get through this way. It was only after a couple of more turns that I realized that this won't work either. While we do take less damage overall, there are only so many Rakukajas we can cast with them costing 12 SP. Also having to recast it every third turn means effectively losing out on DPS as well and yeah, that is not going to work either. Now I was thinking whether or not I could rely on a lucky dodge here, but evading Shadow Yosuke's attacks never really seems to happen and considering we only got a bit more than halfway through his HP, this is not going to be the solution either. I tried this battle a couple of more times, but the result was always the same, so at this point I am rather certain that this battle unfortunately is not possible on hard without using any items. Since I didn't want to quit the challenge at this point already though, we're going to do something that I already did in my very first Persona 4 challenge years back, which is lowering the difficulty for this single fight only. Once the game opens up, this shouldn't be an issue any longer, but I really don't see any other way we could get through this, so for this segment only, we're going to switch to normal. Coming back to this fight on normal is much more manageable. The damage we take is quite a bit lower, while our damage goes up at the same time. Strategy is pretty much like before. Guard when he guards to prevent the one more from Garu, and also guard when he power charges. On every other turn we use Seal for a one more on our end with a regular attack coming up right afterwards. With the difficulty change this looks way more promising and eventually we beat Shadow Yosuke and are able to continue on with the game. We put the difficulty back to hard and go through the next few scripted days. We get the tutorial at the Daras but we're not going to buy anything here at this point. Money is pretty tight in the beginning and since we're only allowed to take a single persona per dungeon, we will have to use the compendium quite a bit. Shortly afterwards, we are already back in the dungeon trying to chase Chie. Since Shadow Chie is level 6, this is also our level cap for now and while it is probably not necessary to level up all the way, I wanted to be safe here. Persona games can be pretty brutal early on and leveling all the way up to level 6 doesn't take very long, so I'd rather choose this method than starting all over again if things go down the drain. We get Pixie during the shuffle tutorial, which is excluded like explained in the runs, and get our first real shuffle in the battle right afterwards, where we get both Slime and Ukobok. Considering Slime actually learns resist physical as its last skill, which we could carry over during fusion, I decided to go with Slime here. And that is our persona for this dungeon. Eventually there will be shuffles happening where we are pretty much forced to choose personas since they are the only option left, but if that happens, we dismiss the persona immediately without ever using it to make sure we stay within the rules of this challenge. Once we reach level 6, we head up further and have to battle Shadow Chie now. Chie likes to use Seo against Yosuke, so we guard with him if necessary. Main character makes sure to Taronda her to reduce the incoming damage, and Yosuke himself can hit Chia's weakness using Garu, which he usually likes to counter with a green wall on the following turn. As long as the wall is up, we mostly focus on her with Seo and physical attacks, as well as reapplying Taronda and heal if necessary. When Chia gets low on HP, she will also start to use Mabufu, but with level 6 on the party and the Taronda up, the damage is not as bad as I first expected. We continue on whittling on her and eventually win the fight and complete part 1 of the dungeon, now also getting access to a third party member. Before heading back into the TV to rescue Yukiko, we start working on our first social links. We start off Marie's social link, which we need anyways, as well as the sports and drama club and get Yosuke to rank 3. We also grab the first couple of books for nighttime activity and start working at the daycare center for another social link and also some more money. Once we're done with everything, we head back into the castle to rescue Yukiko. Our level cap now gets raised all the way to level 15, so with the party only being level 6, we got quite some ways to go now. Early on, I am really careful with enemy encounters. 
if I am not 100% certain that we can wipe the enemies within the first turn. We usually run from the battle. At this point certain enemies can one-shot a party member with some bad luck and I really don't want to risk losing anybody at this point already. We open up some chests on the way though, unlike my last challenge run, chest grinding will not be necessary here at all. The majority of items aren't allowed anyways and the healing items that we pick up throughout the game should be enough to heal up outside of battle if needed. The mini boss Avenger Knight is waiting on floor 5 and has a level of 11. Again, we could probably have gone in much earlier, but I know that the mini boss loves to buff himself with Torokaja and also uses power charge, so I wanted to be prepared for that. Once we reach level 9, we fuse a Senri. Most of you might know this one as the earliest countermeasure against Shadow Yukiko since it's the first persona to null fire damage. Generally, we want to be very selective with our fusion paths considering we need to use the compendium a lot and don't have that much money in the beginning. We level up all the way to level 12 where we can fuse an Eligor which not only resists physical but also has access to fire magic which the mini boss is weak against and we get our first fusion accident. Usually I just reset if that happens but a Valkyrie could actually be useful so might as well keep it. Anyways, once we successfully fuse Naligor, we are off to battle the mini boss. The enemy starts the battle off using Tarukaja, where we counter with a double Agi to make it dizzy. Since we got two turns to work with now, we throw two Tarundas to lower its offense, while Yosuke and Chia start attacking the enemy. For some reason, it only puts up a red wall when you knock it down, but not when you get it dizzy, so once the enemy is back up, it already goes for power charge. Considering I wasn't risking anybody going down, we guard with the entire party, but Nuss actually managed to entirely dodge the attack, so no problem here. We continue on with Agi and physical attacks, and soon after, the mini boss is already down. Okay, good start. I was mildly afraid of what could possibly happen here, so I am pretty glad about that. We only got two more floors left to go until we reach Shadow Yukiko, but once again, we grind a little before that. We are only level 12 and are allowed to go up all the way to level 15, so might as well want to make use of that. A few levels can make a big difference in games like this and with permadeath, I'd rather not take any chance. Also, I know that I'm repeating myself at this point, so I'll just shut up now and skip over to the part where we get to level 15. We return to the Velvet Room in order to fuse a Barif, which is another persona with fire immunity. Due to the higher level, I wanted to go with Barif over Senri, but during fusion I noticed that Barif can't inherit any elemental spells, so overall, Senri is probably still the better choice to go with. With that, we are heading into the first big boss battle of the game against Shadow Yukiko with Nas and Yosuke at level 15 and Chie at 14. We open up the fight casting Bufu with both Nas and Chie and follow up with an all out attack to deal maximum damage. Afterwards, the boss will set up a white wall to prevent weakness hits. We throw out a Toronda and continue doing damage with physical attacks. When Shadow Yukiko readies her burn to ashes attack, we guard with Chia to prevent the one more from a weakness hit. Once the white wall runs out, we continue doing damage with ice magic and follow up all out attacks and shortly afterwards the boss will summon the charming prince. We use both Bufu and Seo to hit weaknesses on both of them and continue on. During this phase, Chie will mostly guard since Shadow Yukiko likes to use Aki at random and if she targets Chie and gets a one more, she's very likely to follow it up with Burn to Ashes which has a good chance to wipe Chie which we obviously want to avoid. While this does make the battle a little longer, I'd rather play it safe than losing a party member. The Charming Prince can put ailments onto the party or heal the boss, but other than that, he isn't really any dangerous. Once we push Shadow Yukiko past a certain HP threshold, the Charming Prince will run away. Again, we mostly guard with Chie since the boss can now use Burn to Ashes without a setup turn before. Nas continues doing damage, while Yosuke either does damage as well or heals up using Dia. The boss will now also use Terror Voice to fear a party member and if it isn't cured within the following turn, she will follow it up with Shivering Rondo, which would probably wipe the character inflicted with it. Luckily we have Patron Barif, so this is not an issue either, and we continue on until we eventually beat the boss and win the very first big boss fight. So far so good, not a big problem as of now. 
thanks to my mandatory encounters only run I have done a couple of months back, I'm still very accustomed to the enemy AI attack patterns, so knowing the potential problems and properly preparing for them does make this quite a bit more manageable. Anyways, we continue on in the real world since we have a bit of downtime now. We continue our social links with Yumi, Marie and the party members and also start the social link with Nanako, the Fox, Daddy Dojima and also Adachi. We also start the social link with Yukiko and we build a vegetable garden. And this is where I would put the great vegetable meme, but for this run they are pretty useless considering we're not allowed to use them in battle anyways. The only kind of useful one is the weed since it serves as a chest key, but we got a ton of those so they're not really needed either. Anyways, at this point the story has already advanced and we're back in the TV world in order to save Kanji. With that, our level cap also gets raised to 25 so we got quite some leeway to work with again. The very first encounter gives us our shuffle time including the one new persona that we are allowed to grab in here, which is a Yomotsu Shikome. Other than that, there isn't much to say about the regular enemies in here. The majority of them have a weakness we can exploit and easily wipe. One of the few exceptions here is the iron dice. Now the problem with dice enemies in general isn't that we can't exploit a weakness, but if we don't manage to wipe them in time, they will explode and hit the entire party for huge almighty damage which has a very good chance to end the entire run. So. I'd rather not take any risks here considering all other enemies are not a big problem. Occasionally we also manage to beat a golden hand which reduces the amount of grinding needed quite a bit. Like mentioned in the rules, we don't allow manipulation, but if we manage to run into one on our way, might as well try to beat it. Before approaching the mini boss, we return back to Yukiko's castle to get the items needed for the side quests we've accepted in the meantime. The majority of them are not that important, but even in a setting like this, I want to be as much of a completionist as somewhat possible. By the time we are done with everything, the party is already at level 21, so we head into the next mini boss fight against Hulk Hogan. Hulkamania uses Power Charge, then uses Rebellion and Tarukaja before throwing out a big single target attack. Since this is the only thing he does, we can prepare for that properly by debuffing his attack with Tarunda and then guard with the entire party when he's about to attack. And guarding is very important as you can see since I forgot to do that the first time around and Yosuke almost got wiped even with a Toronto on the enemy up. Even through the guard the mini boss still hits hard but at least he can one shot anybody which is the most important thing. Afterwards it's just more healing up and throwing out damage and a couple of turns later we're already done here again. We continue on until we reach the top and get to level 25. Before going into the next big boss battle, we fuse a couple of new personas. First up, we fuse a Rakshasa, mostly for the resist physical, and we also get ourselves a queen map for the electricity immunity. With that, we are off into the next boss battle against Shadow Kanji, who is accompanied by Nice Guy and Tough Guy. Once again, we open up the battle casting throne on Kanji. Both adds are weak to fire or ice, so we use that to our advantage to get a couple of extra hits in. Shadow Kanji will always open up with a bit murmur which poisons the male characters but we don't really care too much about that. The more important part is turn 1 where he will always use Mazio. Because of this we guard with Yosuke to prevent the one more and continue on. Nice Guy will usually put up a red wall for Tough Guy or buff Kanji with Tarukasha or Rakukasha while the Tough Guy attacks the party with physical attacks. Every time Kanji loses a fourth of his HP he will use another scripted electricity attack, but as long as we guard with Yosuke, we're pretty much safe here. Luckily Nice Guy only has 800 HP total, so with the weakness hits, he's gone rather soon. Shadow Kanji also likes to use Roar of Wrath, which puts rage on the female party members. Luckily we have Mapatra on Jack Frost, so we can quickly cure that before worse things happen. Again we guard with Yosuke when we hit the next HP threshold to prevent the one more, and soon afterwards, Tough Guy is also gone. Kanji at this point can't do much to the party anymore and a couple of turns later, he goes down as well and we finish off dungeon number 2 with all party members still alive and well. Since we got some downtime now again, we can use that to further enhance our social links. We bring Yukiko up a few levels as well as the other party members. Kanji recovers, joins the party and we start off his social link as well. 
We also continue working on Adachi and started off the social link with Ai before going back into the TV world in order to save Risei. With that, our level cap also gets raised once again to a max level of 35 now. At this point, we also have to decide on a party for the first time since we now have 4 available party members. In this setup, we ditch Yosuke. Kanji is the strongest physical attacker in the entire game, and Yosuke for the most part doesn't really offer anything that is all too important. If somebody goes down, he will rejoin the party, but this is only going to be a backup plan in case things go wrong. I also thought about regularly switching party members in and out, but over time they would all fall back on levels compared to the protagonist, so I'd rather decide on an A team and hopefully get through the entire game with them. As for the dungeon, the majority of random encounters again are not that dangerous. As long as we can exploit enemy weaknesses, we are usually able to take them down in a single turn before they get the chance to act. Our first shuffle time also nets us our new persona for this dungeon, which is a principality. Due to being allowed to use fusions, that is not that important anymore, but I still want to quickly note this every time we enter a new dungeon. Even though the majority of encounters are not that dangerous, we're still playing it as safe as somewhat possible, so we usually run from everything that doesn't have a weakness, or is some kind of dice which could potentially explode on the party. Before battling the mini boss, we also return back to the bathhouse to grab the items needed for the side quests. Theoretically, we could also battle the optional mini bosses on the top floor of the previous dungeons, but some of those can hit rather hard and I'd hate losing a party member to an optional battle, so we still skip those for now. The mini boss is not a big deal either. It will always open up with stagnant air and then try to use virus wave to poison the party. Since it is weak to fire damage, we can deal some nice damage with Ajilao, as well as the following all out attacks. The boss will always use the same attack pattern of stagnant air and virus wave. With a Toronda up, the attacks don't really deal a lot of damage, and we can easily heal up with Yukio's media if needed. A couple of turns later, the enemy is already down, and we continue on. Once we hit our level cap for this dungeon, we are ready to head into the next big boss fight of the game. As for personas, our main persona at the moment is an Ose for physical attacks, with a couple of magic attackers like Sati or King Frost for elemental coverage. Part 1 of the boss fight against Risei is rather easy. Even though she will hit our party members weaknesses with her spells occasionally, they don't deal a lot of damage and once we get through roughly half of her HP, we switch into the scripted phase before starting fight number 2 against Shadow Teddy right afterwards. I also completely forgot that there is a free full heal between those fights, so I could have skipped having everybody at max SP before heading in there at first. Anyways, Shadow Teddy has a wide variety of moves. As always, we open up with Taronda to decrease the amount of incoming damage. Shadow Teddy likes to use Morakonda to decrease everybody's defense, but luckily we have the Kondon Matador to negate that. Teddy also likes to use Heat Wave for physical damage. Luckily with a Taronda up, the damage is not that big and we can easily heal it up with Yukiko if needed. He also likes to inflict silence on the entire party, which is not a big deal as long as Yukiko doesn't get hit by it, since her Umbrito Shaos cures all status ailments. When he goes for Ultra Charge, we basically get a free turn. I very much doubt we would do enough damage to actually interrupt his charging process, but as long as we guard with everybody in the second turn, nobody will take any damage from the attack. As for party damage, we power charge and throw out physical attacks with Nas. Same goes for Chia and Kanji. Yukiko will either use Ajilao or heal up if needed. The most dangerous part about this fight is when he starts using Mind Charge. He will always follow it up with Mabufula, which is probably a one-shot for Yukiko. We switch to King Frost and our protagonist to absorb the damage and guard with everybody else. Unfortunately, the Tarunda ran out at the same time, but with the guard up, the damage is still manageable. Once Shadow Teddy gets below half of his HP, he will use Nullity Guidance to dizzy a character and then charge up for another Ultra Hand. Luckily, party members inflicted with Dizzy will always get up in time before the actual attack goes off, so again we can guard with everybody in order to not take any damage here. At this point, he can also start using Mabufula without charging up first, but luckily Yukiko managed to dodge the attack and prevent the one more. Once Shadow Teddy gets below 25% of his HP, 
you will once again use Nullity Guidance twice before charging up one last time. Just like before though, all party members get up before that, so we can safely guard the attack. The biggest issue at this point is that Nuss is starting to run out of SP. Due to power charging regularly and him also being on both Taronda and Dekunda duty, his SP won't last us through the entire fight and this might become a problem towards the end since we have no way to debuff the enemy or negate the party's debuffs any longer. Since we are not allowed to use any items, we don't have any chance to regenerate our SP either. Luckily Yukiko still has the majority of our SP left, so we should be safe on heals for now at least. And just as I say this, Shadow Teddy hits Mabufula on Yukiko and charges up for another one. We use our last SP on the protagonist to heal everybody and with the guard are barely able to keep everybody alive. While the beginning of the battle was rather easy, it is getting increasingly more difficult now towards the end. Yukiko at this point is on healing duty solely, while the other party members are trying to get rid of the last bits of Shadow Teddy's HP. Foolish Whisper at this point is the best possible attack since it doesn't do any damage and as long as Yukiko isn't hit by it, it's not a big problem. Marakunda is another thing we can't negate any longer either, so we need to try to finish this battle as quickly as somewhat possible now. Another charged Mabufula again gets the party dangerously close to being wiped, but the following Foolish Whisper luckily gives us some leeway to recover. At this point Shadow Teddy is almost finished, so we continue pummeling on the boss and with a lucky counter from Nuss, Teddy knocks himself out and we win the battle. Not going to lie, this was way closer than I expected at first, but we made it through the fight with everybody still alive, so even though this was not going like I thought it would, at least we didn't lose any party members here. With that, we have quite some downtime again, so once again, we use that to further our confidence. We start the confident with Naoki, as well as Saiko in the hospital here. Great vegetables! We also harvest some cabbage for one of the side quests. The reason I mentioned this one specifically is the reward for it, which is the Sharp Shovel for Nuss, which grants him Auto Tarukasha. This makes taking care of random encounters in dungeons much easier, so you definitely want to grab that one. After riding the scooter several times, we get access to Okina. Due to our level cap, we probably won't use the cinema much, but the cafe for skill cards might have some situational use, so it's definitely worth to keep that in the back of our minds. We also continue working on our party members. Yukiko is our first party member to reach rank 9, at which point we will also romance her. I have never romanced Yukiko before and considering she is one of the most important party members in pretty much every playthrough I have done of this game up until now, it's only fair she gets to be the chosen one this time around. After starting the confident with both Risei and the old lady at the river, we're pretty much ready to head into the next dungeon to get some more information about Mitsuo. We get our newest level cap here and I wasn't really sure on what to go for here. The wiki says that Shadow Mitsuo himself is level 45, but the hero in phase 1 of the boss fight is level 47. Considering we usually go by the main boss's level, I decided to set the cap at level 45. I honestly doubt the two levels will make that big of a difference, but we'll find out when we get there I guess. Again, we also have to decide on our party setup going forward. With Teddy available now, Chia has to warm the bench since he's taking her place. Both of them are very similar when it comes to skills and while Chia is more physically oriented compared to Teddy, Teddy does get access to both Mataru Kasha and Maraku Kasha eventually. Being able to split the buffing duty on several characters is really nice and even though Chia would get access to an AoE Heat Riser with a third awakening later on, the SP cost of 150 is way too much in a setup where we can't use items, so I can't really justify using her over Teddy. As for the dungeon enemies, it is pretty much the same as in previous dungeons. Everything that is weak to some kind of element usually goes down within a turn, and for enemies without weakness, especially those on higher floors, we usually run away. The first persona during shuffle time will be our only pick for this dungeon, this time around it is power that the game chooses. I mentioned this before, but at this point this is not really an issue since we're still allowed to fuse, but might as well at least give it a quick shout out. Just like last time, we also return to the previous dungeon in order to get all the side quest items needed. 
As soon as we reach level 38, we return to the Velvet Room and get ourselves a Black Frost. Not only does Black Frost have excellent elemental affinity coverage, he also gets access to Mind Charge, both Ice Boost and Ice Amp, and also Mara Kukasha for an AoE defense buff. He's also our first Persona to get a tier 3 spell with Archidine, and with Fire Amp coming along as well, he can put out some serious DPS. The mini boss for this dungeon is a Killing Hand, which usually opens up by summoning an Almighty Hand. While Killing Hand doesn't have a weakness, we can use the Almighty Hand's Ice Weakness to get a couple of 1 mores and get some good damage in. Other than summoning, Killing Hand will only use Deathbound, which doesn't really deal a lot of damage, so we can easily heal that up again. After a couple of turns, both mini boss and Eds are down, and we're able to continue on. We are also starting to tackle the first couple of optional bosses. I did briefly mention this in the previous dungeon that we are not going to do those unless we are absolutely safe to not lose any party members, but I think at this point our party level is high enough to do the first two at least. Contrarian King has a very nasty rampage attack, so we use Tarunda on it and also buff our own defense with Mara Kokasha. The party does decent damage considering the level difference, but I was still worried since I remember that attack being very dangerous. In the end, we never even got that far as the boss went down before he ever had the chance to use it. In hindsight, we could have probably done that fight a little earlier, but in this setup I'd rather be safe than sorry. The main reason we did that fight to begin with is the weapon we can grab for Yukiko afterwards, which gives an extra 50 SP. And since we're already at it, we continue on with the second optional boss, Intolerant Officer. Even though he's weak to electricity, he takes reduced damage from it and due to him also having an almighty resistance, it's not really worth exploiting too much. Just like before, we debuff his attack and buff our defense and go to work. Similar to Contrarian King, his damage output isn't really all too bad and the damage we do is not too shabby either. Generally, there isn't much to say about this boss fight. By the time our buffs run out, the enemy is already almost down, so we quickly finish him off and also grab a new weapon for Kanji. I did briefly think about going for the last optional boss battle as well, but considering we're not that overleveled like in the last two battles, I really didn't want to risk anything, so I decided to continue on with our current dungeon. We only got a couple of more levels until the cap of 45, so we continue grinding until we get there. During that, we also managed to beat a set of 3 golden hands, which put us from 44 directly to 46. Uh, well, luckily I saved just a couple of minutes before that, so we reload the earlier save and make sure we don't go above our level cap this time around. Once the party reaches level 45 for real, we head into the battle against Shadow Me Too, and after still having PTSD for my previous mandatory battles only run, I was honestly rather scared of this boss. Shadow Mitsuo is the first boss to get two attacks each turn and also comes in two phases. In the first one, you have to beat the hero form which at the start can only use attack or item, both of which only do single target damage. With buffs up, the incoming damage is really not too bad and while the hero only takes 75% damage from physical attacks, it still goes down rather quickly after a few turns transitioning into phase 2 of the battle against Baby Mitsuo. Now I'm not going to go into too many details about how this fight is set up, so we'll stick to the basics here. If you are interested in the details, check out my mandatory battles only challenge I've done a couple of months ago, which I'll link in the info cards. Anyways, once Baby Mitsuo is out, he will use an elemental wall and follow it up with the AoE version of said element for the next 3 turns. He also likes to use the Kasha and the Kunda regularly, so we have to reapply our buffs and debuffs more often as well. Remember that we ran out of SP against Shadow Teddy towards the end, so SP management is going to become pretty important, especially in later parts of the challenge run I assume. Unfortunately we got unlucky with the elements here with Baby Mitsuo applying an Ice Wall. Since he will now attack with Mabufula for 3 turns, we have to guard with Yukiko to prevent the one more. If he manages to hit a weakness, he will follow it up with Megidola, which we want to avoid at all costs since it can easily wipe the entire party. Since he also resists ice during those turns, Teddy also becomes rather useless in terms of dishing out damage, so his job is either applying Matsurukasha or healing if necessary. 
Nas either buffs the party's defense or mind charges for a big boosted Bufula while Kanji goes for par charge and then follows up with physical attacks. Even though the boss only takes 75% damage from physical attacks, it's still doing more damage compared to Siyonga considering Kanji's magic stat is really low. Once the wall runs out, Baby Mitsuo will start rebuilding the hero form, which we need to prevent at all costs. If he manages to successfully rebuild it, he will gain access to the skill command which is a very strong AoE almighty spell, so we need to do enough damage to him to interrupt that. Yukiko is doing rather good damage with Ajilao, and Nas and Kanji will use their charge first and follow it up with big damage the next turn. This strategy works out rather well for the most part. Baby Mitsuo will also try to inflict ailments onto the party, but luckily we have him read on Yukiko to counteract that. During later parts of the battle, he will start building two stages of the hero within a single turn, so once again we need to be very quick trying to take it down before he gets finished. After he puts up another wall, this time for wind, we continue doing damage while guarding with Kanji to prevent the one more. The following turn is already enough to deplete the last bits of HP and we already managed to win the battle. Not going to lie, this went way smoother than I expected at first. Sure, being level 45 definitely helps, but with potential SP management issues and the entire mechanics surrounding this battle, I was pretty sure we'd run into way bigger problems, but who am I to complain? We return to the real world and once again got some downtime now. We continue building social links with our party members and also discover Shinchiri Beach after driving around with the motorbike some more. Our waifu Yukiko is also the first party member to reach her max social link. Getting access to the evade skills is going to be very important considering a lot of bosses will try to get one more later into the run. We catch a river guardian and go visit the beach where we tell Kanji to let him dangle. Challenge runs are invalid if you choose any other options, just saying. We also redeem our biggest mistake from the previous challenge run by agreeing to help out Nanaka with our homework. This was probably my biggest regret last time, so we make sure to be a good big bro this time around. Once everything is done, Naoto shows up on the Midnight Channel, so it's back into the TV world in order to save her. Since we're entering a new dungeon, our level cap now gets raised another 10 levels all the way up to level 55 as well. Again, the majority of random encounters here are not a problem. In our first shuffle time we get our new persona for this dungeon, which is an Orpheus. Just like the last few times, this is only for mentioning since it usually doesn't matter at this point any longer. We continue on making our way through the dungeon grinding enemies. Everything that has a weakness can easily be dispatched and enemies without weakness usually go down rather quickly with physical attacks. Speaking of physical attacks, we also get to fuse my personal favorite challenge run persona with Giri Mekala. At this point, I think most of you know the drill. Not only does Giri Mekala repel physical attacks natively, he will also gain the passive skill Repel Physical, which we can carry over by fusion later on, so once again, he is probably one of the most important personas in yet another challenge run. Just like in the previous dungeon segments, we also head back into the last dungeon to quickly grab the items needed for the new side quest we have gotten before returning back into the laboratory. The mini boss here is the dominating machine which only uses power charge before throwing out an Herculean strike. With Tarunda up, the incoming damage is not too bad and we start going to work on the enemy. With Giri Mikala equipped, our protagonist literally takes no damage at all and the reflected damage does help out a little as well. Other than that, this fight is rather simple. Towards the end of the battle, the mini boss will start vibrating and explode if you don't beat it in time, dealing decent amounts of almighty damage to the party. Luckily we get it done before that happens, so this is nothing we have to worry about. We make our way through the dungeon and once we hit level 55, we are ready to tackle Shadow Naoto now. Naoto has access to all kinds of elemental spells and physical attacks as well as Tetrakarn and Makarakarn, but one of the things I'm worried about most is Mute Ray, which not only inflicts silence but also drains SP and if you remember, running out of SP is probably the most dangerous thing to happen. Naoto also likes to hit party members with their weaknesses and follows it up casting either the Kunda or the Kasha to remove buffs and debuffs. 
Luckily we can just recast those and as long as they're up, the incoming damage is not that big of an issue. The main damage dealers here are Nas and Kanji, who can both use Mind Charge or Power Charge to deal big amounts of damage to the boss. Yukiko's job is healing and dealing damage with Archidine, while Teddy usually buffs the party's attack, while also throwing out some ice spells in the meantime. In the later parts of the battle, Naoto starts throwing out AoE spells as well, and follows them up with Heat Rise on the one more. Debuffing her attack is not an issue, but since we don't have access to Debilitate yet, we mostly ignore the defense and evasion buff. While this causes some attacks to miss and deal less damage, overall it's not that big of an issue. The evade passives from the last social rank also put in some work here as party members regularly dodge the move and therefore prevent another one more. And that is pretty much it for this battle. We continue on doing damage and eventually win the battle against Naoto as well, with all party members still alive and well. During the downtime, we once again focus on our social links. Marie being the only one we need to max in order to get the golden exclusive content, but this is not a big problem for the most part. We also work on the non-party member social links. Generally, we will try to max pretty much everyone in order to get the most out of the Arcana bonus during fusion. At this point, we start maxing the majority of them, including the Jima, Nanako, the Fox, and also start off the last social link with Shu. Shortly afterwards, Naoto joins the party, but as of right now, she will probably not see much use unless one of my main party members go down. While Naoto doesn't have any weaknesses, she can't cover any of the other party members' spots, so she will be benched and serve as a backup if needed. The party opens up this pit, and Nanako gets kidnapped and thrown into the TV world shortly afterwards, so it's back into action. The level cap gets raised another 10 levels for a total of 65, and we start to get going. For the sake of mentioning it, our first shuffle time in this dungeon gets us our new persona for here, which would have been an Arasima. Unfortunately, we already fused that earlier in order to get access to Tamlin, so there will be nothing new this time around. Not that it matters, just wanted to quickly mention that again. Generally, random encounters at this point are pretty much no issue anymore. Everything with a weakness is usually wiped on turn 1, and even those without weakness generally go down rather quickly with the help of physical attacks. Once again, we also go back into the previous dungeon in order to get all the quest items before returning back to rescue Nanako. The mini boss in this one is World Balance, which always charges up first and then throws out a spell of a random element. Luckily the first one is fire and targets Yukiko so she takes no damage and with an attack debuff up, the damage, even when hitting a weakness, is not really any dangerous. Kanji has gotten access to Maturo Kaja in the meantime so he will now focus on attack buffs while Teddy will use Maruko Kaja to buff the party's defense. Other than that, it's the same as always and a few turns later the battle is already over again. We head into the Velvet Room to fuse another Narasimha and carry over Auto Maraku as well as Auto Masuku. With it learning Auto Mataru on level 53, we basically got a full party buff for the first 3 turns at the start of every battle, which definitely makes things quite a bit easier as well. With that, we are now up against the first of the big bosses with Kuni no Zakiri, and while I got a relative good strategy for this boss, I am still quite a bit afraid since a lot of unforeseen things can potentially happen here. As always, we start the fight by debuffing the enemy, buff our party and go to work with our attacks. In phase 1, Kuni no Sakiri mostly either uses single target or AoE magical attacks. Luckily the evade passives are once again putting in good work here dodging potential weakness hits. Once he hits phase 2, he uses Guad Converge which will greatly increase the damage of one element while decreasing the damage of all other ones. Since at this point we don't know what element he has chosen, I decided to guard with all party members to make sure nobody goes down to an unlucky hit or something. In this case, he chose Wind which he will now use for the next couple of turns. Because of this, we will constantly guard with Kanji in order to prevent one more, while attacking the boss with Wind Magic if possible. This does mean that our attack buff is eventually going to run out, but I'd rather play it safe here and not risk losing anybody of my A-team. 
Once the quad converge is over, we continue on just like before, before the next quad converge is being cast. At first I wanted to guard with everybody again, but then decided against it. When I saw the damage on Teddy's Bufodine, I realized that we just accidentally guessed the correct element, so we guard with Yukiko and continue on just like before. And while magic attacks from every other element other than ice are greatly reduced during this, Konino Sagiri will still take neutral damage from physical attacks, so we also power charge with Kanji before unleashing his wrath on the boss. In phase 3, Kunino Sakiri starts taking control over several party members. Once this happens, we switch into Black Frost and our protagonist. Black Frost absorbs both fire and ice attacks and considering Yukiko and Teddy are very likely to use those, the amount of HP recovered is higher than the amount of damage taken. And even in the unlikely case of Nuss getting close to being wiped, we could always switch into Tam Lin who has access to Enduring Soul which pretty much gives us a full heal in the case of being wiped. In the last phase, the boss will start spamming Unearing Justice, which inflicts AoE Almighty damage. Luckily with buffs and debuffs up, the incoming damage is really not a big issue. Kanji at this point has run out of his piece, so we don't have any attack buff options anymore, but the boss at this point doesn't really have a whole lot of HP left either. We continue on like before, and after a few more turns, Kuni no Sakiri is down and Nanako is rescued. While I was a little afraid going into this battle, the strategy I had in mind worked pretty well and we still got all party members alive. Good thing I still remember the enemy's AI pretty well from my previous challenge run. Anyways, once again we have quite some downtime before we are heading back into action. We head into the hot springs with Yukiko to learn some of her bike skills. The one I am most interested in is her rank 5 ability where she gains access to Mind Charge. Unfortunately, I was so occupied with social links up until now that I mostly forgot about the bike dates at all, which means she probably won't be getting access to Mind Charge by the next dungeon, but I think we should be fine regardless. We also max the social links of the remaining party members we haven't gotten so far. We're getting to a point where there isn't much left to do during evenings, so we usually either read books or make models later on. I haven't gotten the achievement for reading all books yet, so might as well do that since we don't really have a lot of other things to do anyways. A few days later Nanako dies, we investigate Namatame, Nanako doesn't actually die and Adachi escapes into the TV world. Unlike every other dungeon, we will wait until the last day before we head back into the TV since the time automatically skips forward if you do it early, so might as well try to get the most out of the bits of time left. We max the last social links, including Teddy and also Marie, and shortly afterwards are back into the TV world. Our level cap once again gets raised to a max level of 75. At this point, we also start doing Margaret's link. I have pretty much neglected fusing the needed personas up until this point, but with all the resources available now, we can get her rank up all the way to 9. For level 10, we need a Trumpeter which we can't fuse until level 67, which coincidentally is also one of the personas I wanted to get regardless for a reason we will talk about in just a few. As always, we start our dungeon segment by going back into the previous dungeon in order to grab all the side quest items needed. Once we're done with everything, we also just got to level 67, so like mentioned before, we will now fuse a trumpeter in order to max out Margaret's social link as well. Not only does it have incredible elemental affinities, the even more important part here is that Trumpeter is the first persona to learn debilitate on level 73. The Arcana boost unfortunately isn't enough to get it just there yet, but since we got quite some levels until we cap out anyways, I'm sure we will get there in time before the big boss. Our new persona for this dungeon is Belfigur. At this point I honestly didn't even pay attention anymore since it doesn't really make a difference anyways, but again for completionist's sake, I wanted to mention it. The first mini boss coming up is a Chaos Fuzz, which will summon more Chaos Fuzz and other enemies as the battle goes on, so ideally you want to beat all of them at the same time. Unfortunately, due to some misses, this isn't always as easy as it seems. Luckily, the battle still doesn't really pose any real threat, and after a couple of turns of spamming AoE attacks, we get done rather quickly here. 
The second mini boss, Envious Giant, is the one I am more worried about. Since it likes to spam Tantaru Fool, we equip Yukiko with the Book of Serenity, which makes her recover ailments in one turn, so she can use Amrita to heal the entire party if necessary. The only other attack the boss uses is Megidolaon, but this one doesn't really deal a lot of damage, even without debuffs up. We use both Ice and Fire Break in order to negate the resistances and start going to work. Envious Giant takes 4 times damage from physical attacks, but at the same time it also has high counter, which is very annoying in a situation like this, so the spells help in doing the damage as well. And yeah, that is pretty much all. Heal with Amrita if the enemy uses Tentarufu, heal up HP if necessary, and go to work until the boss is down. At this point, we are also almost at the level cap already, so we get the last bits of experience needed before continuing on into the big boss battle right afterwards. Once again, my biggest fear going into this is running out of SP since it is two back-to-back -back fights with no healing between them, the first one being against Adachi. Adachi always starts the battle using Heat Riser, so we use Debilitate twice to make sure all his stats are debuffed before going to work with our party. Adachi also has a 50% resistance to physical attacks, so Kanji's damage, even with a power charge, is not necessarily the highest. He can use all kinds of elemental spells, but mostly stuck to using Warple Blade here, which I most definitely don't mind at all, since one Morse can make this battle quite a bit trickier. Thanks to Risei, we also get a full party charge. Adachi tries to wait main character for Mudon, but it's too late and he's already down the turn after. Battle 1 out of 2 was easy and we still got a lot of SP left, so this looks rather promising. Against Amino Zagiri, we open up using Debilitate just like before. Having all three auto mass spells is definitely a huge help in situations like this since we don't need to worry about any buffs for the first three turns of the battle. Once again, we start going to work, charging on characters with access to it, before dishing out damage. Amino Sakiri mostly uses single target elemental attacks and Agni Red first, which don't really deal a lot of damage with buffs and debuffs up. If the boss manages to hit a weakness, it will usually follow up by using either the Kasha or the Kunda, which is annoying, but not really that dangerous since we can just recast buffs and debuffs. Once again Risei comes in clutch with an AoE charge, which results in the party not only doing much more damage on the following turn, but also completely skipping the very first scripted fog at 50% of its HP and head directly into the second scripted fog attack at 25% HP remaining. We rebuff the party, debuff the boss before the attack and eat the big nebula oculus without any big issues. At this point Amino Sakiri also mostly uses either the Kasha or the Kunda or sometimes even both within a turn so we buff and debuff if necessary and a couple of turns later, the boss is down and the battle is won. Not going to lie, this was way easier than I expected at first. The AoE charge from Risa certainly came in at the perfect time, but even without it, I doubt we would have had any bigger problems getting through this fight. We spent both Christmas and New Year's Eve with our waifu, build a teddy man and continue maxing the last missing social links. We also get the third awakening on all our party members and manage to get the last bike skill on Yukiko on the very last day that she's available. I would love to pretend that this was all planned and perfectly executed on my part, but the reality is that I completely forgot about bike dates for like half of the game and lucked into the situation where I was still barely able to get it, but whatever. In the end, we got it and that's all that matters. The party goes on a skiing trip, we get interrupted trying to have sexy time by a voyeuristic party and end up in the TV world trying to rescue Marie now. The level cap gets raised, though this time only by two levels, to level 77. And everybody that has played this game before knows that this won't be an issue because we're trying to get through this dungeon as quickly as somewhat possible. For those who don't know, let me quickly explain. The Hollow Forest has a special mechanic where all your equipment and items will be taken away once you enter it, and if this wasn't bad enough already, your party's SP will also be halved after every single battle. While you do get accessories for auto SP recovery, this is still rather annoying so for the most part we're going to rush through this one. 
since there are no side quests open at this point anymore either, this will be rather quick. The first mini boss on floor 3 is the Gorgeous King. The mini boss will summon a number of different enemies to the field which all have some kind of weakness. The king itself is weak to physical attacks, but barely takes any damage from them. The intended way is basically to force all out attacks and deal damage to him by almighty. Because of this, my initial plan was to just mind charge into make it allowed with our protagonist, but of course the enemy is smart enough to see that coming and immediately silences him. Still, this fight is not a big problem at all. Either exploit weaknesses and follow them up with all out attacks, or just go with almighty damage and a couple of turns later, mini boss number 1 is already down and out. Mini boss number 2 is the heaven's giant which nulls all elements, resists physical and only takes very reduced damage from almighty attacks as well. The enemy will try to enrage characters and can use all kinds of elemental spells as well. The plan here is to use elemental breaks in order to nullify his immunities and then go to work. Something I haven't really mentioned yet was keeping Fire Break on Yukiko and Ice Break on Teddy. In pretty much every playthrough I have done, I never really kept the breaks since other skills were more important, but in this setup, they are literally our only way to beat the game since we will need them against Marie later on due to not being allowed to use items, but more on that in a few. Anyways, the mini boss is not a big struggle, and a couple of attacks later, we are already done again. We climb up the last couple of floors and then head into the boss fight against Marie. Once again, this fight is split up into two phases. In phase 1, we have to battle Marie, but we only have to deplete roughly a third of her HP before she goes into her scripted phase and transitions into phase 2. During the first phase, she's still neutral to all elements, but repels physical attacks. This phase in general is not a big issue. Even though Marie disses two characters on her first turn, her Megi Dalaun barely does any damage and the three turns where we have full party buffs from our Automa skills are already enough to push her into the scripted part where she will use Shell of Denial before transitioning. We start phase 2 with our SP halved once again and this time around Marie repels literally everything. Like briefly mentioned before, the strategy here is to use elemental breaks in order to deal damage to her. We have Ice Break on Teddy and Fire Break on Yukiko. I also wanted to bring Electricity Break on the protagonist since we deleted it from Kanji's moveset, but unfortunately I was in such a hurry to get out of here that I completely forgot about that, so Kanji's sole purpose in this battle is to rebuff everybody's attack with Maturu Kasha. Kusumi no Okami has a wide variety of attacks in this phase, but none of them really deal a whole lot of damage. Technically, she also has access to all kinds of elemental spells, but she never really used any of those, so once we got the breaks up and running, we start doing damage. Both Nas and Yuki combine charge into Archidine, while Teddy does damage using Bufodine, and as you can see with the amounts of damage we are dealing here, this battle is going to be over rather quickly. Both protagonist and Yukiko deal way over a thousand damage with their attacks, so after rebuffing, renewing the elemental break and charging up one more time, we are already done with the battle and Marie is rescued. Very uneventful battle to be honest, but hey, we're about to head into the final dungeon with everybody alive, so this run went pretty smoothly so far. We spend Valentine's Day with our waifu and get ready to go home on the final day before noticing that there is still a missing piece in all of this. Izanami gets identified as the one behind everything and we're off into the final dungeon of the game. For the last time, the level cap once again gets raised to the final level of level 90. I highly doubt we will get up that high anyway since experience in here isn't that high and we only battle what's on the way to the top pretty much. The last new persona for this run is an alley lad. We could have also chosen you longer, but at this point it doesn't really matter since we're pretty much set up for the final boss anyways and I doubt we're gonna do any more fusions. The first mini boss on floor 3 is Neo Minotaur and there is not really a whole lot to say about this one. The only thing it does is Rampage, which doesn't deal a whole lot of damage and considering it's taking 450% damage from all elemental attacks, it goes down relatively quickly. Charge up, fire away and win the battle. Mini boss number 2 is the sleeping table which gives everybody who has played Persona 3 some PTSD. 
This one is slightly more dangerous compared to the Minotaur, considering it can fear the party and then try to insta-wipe them with Ghastly Whale, or also use Mahama on. Luckily for me, it never went for those for the most part, so once again, it's debuffing the enemy with Debilitate, charge up and unleash our party until the boss is down soon after. And with that, we're now ready to tackle the final boss of this challenge. At this point, the party was level 78 and I was thinking whether to grind to level 80 for safety means, but honestly, at this point, I am pretty confident in our setup and strategy, so we should be fine for the most part. My biggest fear once again is running out of SP considering the final fight consists of two back-to-back -back battles. Phase 1 Izanami has 3500 HP and is rather tame for the most part. While she has access to all kinds of elemental spells, she usually likes to focus on Megiddo Lawn, which doesn't deal that much damage with buffs and debuffs up. Again we open up with Debilitate and charge up both Yukiko and Kanji. Yukiko's attacks deal a ton of damage and even Kanji puts out some good numbers considering both faces of Izanami have a 50% damage reduction from physical attacks. It's only a couple of turns until we burn through her HP, which triggers phase 1 and here is where I made a slight error that could cost me. Unlike the Amino Sakiri fight, this battle is not split up into two separate fights, but it's just a transition from phase 1 to phase 2, which means our auto buffs are not going to be reapplied. Unfortunately, our defense buff just ran out as well, and Teddy has to guard since Izanami no Okami will always open up with Mind Charge and follow it up with Maziodine. Luckily, we can also buff with Barong, which additionally nulls electricity, so we can guard with Teddy while healing up with Yukiko and buffing with Kanji. Once the party is fully recovered, it's back to the same, charging and putting out damage while keeping buffs and debuffs up. Izanami no Kami mostly spams almighty attacks and considering she gets two actions each turn, those can add up quite a bit over time. Because of this, Teddy is pretty much on healing duty solo, unless the majority of the party manages to dodge both attacks. Yukiko and Kanji once again charge and unleash damage, while Nas cycles through the Debilitate, Mind Charge and Archidine as well. One of the most dangerous combinations in this one is Galgalam Ice or World's End on the first action since those can inflict enervation, where she usually follows up with summons to Yomi right afterwards which will insta-wipe every party member inflicted with an ailment. Luckily we got Endure on all party members and also Reese's AoE block available once if needed, so we do have a couple of safety nets here. In this case, they weren't even needed though since she only used Galgalim Ice and Wells End once in the entire fight, and both times no ailments were applied to any party member. And yeah, that is pretty much all there is to talk about in this battle. Our protagonist is slowly starting to run out of SP, but at this point the final boss is almost done and a couple of turns later we hit the final blow and complete this challenge for good. Also shoutouts to Risa for a party charge right after we win the battle and at the descriptive phase. Good job Risa, well done. Anyways, we go through the scripted cutscenes, see every social league we maxed out once again, good grief, that's quite a lot even on fast forwards, and afterwards we finish Izanami no Kami off with myriad troops to end the last battle. And that is it everybody. We beat Persona 4 Golden in a Nuzlocke setting without losing a single party member. Even though we weren't allowed to use items this time around, the run wasn't all too bad for the most part to be honest, mostly due to the ability to fuse personas. If I decide to do another Nuzlocke in the future, I will probably ban fusion and item usage, which will probably make it way harder, but that's a problem for future Ragnar. I do have a couple of more SMT slash Persona challenge run ideas lined up, and I also want to do some challenges on Persona 3 Reload once I beat the game casually as well, so expect something to see like that pop up in the future. Also, as always, special shoutouts go to this video's Patreon URL. If you want to join the Patreon as well, the link is below in the video description. Becoming a Patreon gives you 48 hour early access to new challenge runs, among other things, but enough of the plugs for now. That's it for me this time, thank you all for watching, I hope you enjoyed the video as much as I enjoyed the run, and I hope to see you all next time again. 
Until then, take care.